Thank you, Sven. Um, yeah, so I want to tell you a bit of a story. Um, the story starts when I was in 10th grade. Um, in 10th grade, I had what maybe today you would call a nerdy childhood. Um, there was no girlfriends, but we had our home computers, we programmed them, and we played Dungeons and Dragons. So, um, and what I also had is I had a friend who gave me books about the mind, about consciousness, and stuff like that. And uh, reading those books, I got like two things. One is, I realized what is actually quite obvious, that the mind is involved in any kind of experience you have. So whether you win the lottery, whether you have a job or you don't have a job, a mind makes this into something pleasant, unpleasant, it, you know, it makes judgments of it, and so on and so on. And the second thing these books said is that the mind can actually be trained. So the authors claim that with you know, some kind of practices, you can train your mind in a way that it becomes more useful or um, you know, so that you can become a more friendly person or that others see you as more friendly or more helpful for others and so on. Um, so reading that, realizing that back then, I started to meditate because that's what these books were about. And I meditated and meditated, and I did it probably for two months. And then I stopped. Why did I stop? I stopped because I realized, or not really realized, but it kind of, kind of happened, that um, I actually didn't really know what I was doing. So, you know, I, I tried to meditate, but then I read the instructions, and they, honestly, they weren't really very clear. So, kind of meditation dropped out of my life again, and uh, it didn't come back, at least not explicitly, for a long time. And it came back around five years ago. Five years ago, I, I was self-employed for around a year, and um, things were actually really going well. So, my first year was actually much better than I expected, on the outside. On the inside, I realized I actually felt quite stressed and thought, well, maybe th these are maybe the signs, first signs of a burnout or something. So I wasn't sure. So then it was Christmas break, and I did some research, and I stumbled again across mindfulness. And mindfulness is like one of the big things if you look at stress prevention and depression prevention. Um, so I kind of did some research into that, and I realized that in those, you know, a bit more than 20 years, lots of stuff had happened. One thing that has happened was that science got into mindfulness. So there was actually a lot of science going on, and I will talk about that a little bit more. And the second thing I realized is that there were quite a few of Western mindfulness or, med or meditation teachers who had written down their knowledge in a much more accessible way. Partly because they want to work together with scientists, and when you want to work with scientists, you need a language that you can really agree upon that is quite clear and precise. So they had done that. They had written down their knowledge much more clear and also their instructions. So again, I was hooked. Uh, First thing was, I realized science says that, you know, it's not all bullshit, it's not all esoteric, whatever. And the second thing, instructions were much clearer. Um, so I deep dived into that, uh, read a couple of books, went to a couple of retreats, became a teacher for search inside yourself, uh, this Google program. Um, and, um, yeah, I want to tell you today a little bit about what I learned on that path and how I think the skills that are mindfulness about are useful in, in our everyday work as knowledge workers. So, how is this structured? Yes. So, I'm going to talk a bit about what mindfulness is about. We're also going to do a little bit of practice because, honestly, I don't want to talk the whole time. Then we're going to look a bit at the science, and then we just close off with questions and everything. So, what is mindfulness and what is meditation about? So, some definitions. Um, who has a 
regular meditation practice, whatever that means for you. So if you dare to raise your hand, oh, oh wow, it's like 10, 15 percent, I would say. Wow, that's pretty good. What, what's regular? Like from someone who raised their hand somewhere over there, what's regular? How often do you practice? Daily? Daily? Wow. Cool. That's great. Yeah. I usually say, well, regular means once a month, but actually if you really want to achieve something, daily is a kind of rather do it shorter and more often than, you know, one weekend and then you sit for an hour or something. So you, you might have a, a lot of associations with the word meditation. Um, you might think that you have to sit in positions where your knees hurt or like wearing orange robes or something. And of course, all of that is true as part of the mindfulness culture. But the thing is, you don't really have to do that. Meditation, like the original word, uh, it comes from a Sanskrit word, which, uh, which you pronounce bhavana. And bhavana actually means cultivating. It's like cultivating the ground or the soil so that things can grow. So meditation, actually a more modern translation, would probably be something like practice. Yeah? Practice or exercise. So whenever you hear the word meditation in a, in a modern context, think of it basically as, as training your mind, exercising your mind. Similar like you go to a gym where you mostly exercise your body, like think of meditation as practice for the mind. So that's the one word, meditation. So I, and I have mentioned some other, another word, mindfulness, and I want to spend a bit more time defining and clarifying what that is. There are actually many definitions of mindfulness, if you ask like the, all the teachers out there. Um, I'm going to use one that is more practical and operationally uh, useful. So my, one of my teachers, he defines mindfulness in terms of three skills, like every mindfulness practice develops three skills in one way or the other. And we're going to go through those. Um, so the first one is concentration. What is concentration? Um, concentration is actually the capacity to focus on whatever you find important in any given moment. And um, my guess is that many of you are developers, and I really hope that you know states of high concentration, because developing software is actually one, one job, one task, where you can get into that quite often. Yeah. And yet you probably know that when you, you, know, you get into your office or wherever you work, and you, know, you have this kind of really cool thing you want to do today, and you have one of those lucky, lucky days you get into the office, you sit down in, the, on your, in front of your computer, and nobody disturbs you. So you, you, know, you get really into it, you know, and you work, and you, you, know, you really concentrate, you get into whatever you want to do, you get into this, what's also called a flow state. And like three hours later, you, whatever, it's lunch, or you have to pee, and you kind of look up from your computer screen, and you realize, wow, that was really cool. So I did you know, I got so much stuff done and it was really great work I just did. That's a state of high concentration. So now imagine you could get into that state at will basically at any time you want and regarding any topic you want. That would be really, really, really high concentration, yeah, if you could do that. And meditation is training that. I'm not saying that it's easy to get there, I'm definitely not there, but that, that's what meditation or mindfulness training is doing. So, for the people who read my uh, um, talk announcement or the, the little text I handed in, I also said that I'm going to use a lot of analogies um, for programming. So I'm going to explain all these three skills with each one with an analogy with programming. And actually, that makes a lot of sense to do that, because when you ask people who meditate for a really long time what they are doing, they usually say something like, um, well, what I'm doing is I'm exploring how my mind works and how it kind of relates to reality. So I'm, I'm really you know, trying to find that out. So if I translate that into our language, 
It actually means that what these people are doing is they explore, they, they find out more about the hardware and software they are running. Yeah? They find out more about their operating system, about kind of the core things in their system, how these works. So how do we do that when we develop software? Well, we have a software development environment. Yeah? And this gives us a couple of tools. It gives us, for example, a debugger. And a debugger has usually the capacity to set breakpoints. And setting breakpoints is a good, also a good analogy for concentration. Because when you have high concentration, what actually happens is that you get the skill to have a wider gap between a trigger, something happening to you, and a response. So, for example, my whatever, my boss calls, and you know, I see her number on the phone, and I go, oh my god, uh, okay, I take it, and then I you know, sound grumpy when I take it because I don't want to be disturbed, or whatever is going on. Yeah? So, a lot of these reactions we are having are basically automatic. You know, something happens, and I react in an automatic way, in a way I've at some point in my life trained, and that might be useful, and in other times it might not be useful. Concentration really gives you the capacity to decide what you want to do. It gives you a little break between trigger and response, because you can focus and basically stop for a moment, so it seems like you have more time to decide. So setting breakpoints is an analogy. So how is concentration useful in daily life. Um, well, I mean, one thing I, I hope is clear, like if you can really, in our kind of work, concentrate like this, it's extremely useful. Like you're in a busy office, lots of stuff is going on, people want lots of stuff from you, and you can decide on what is really important now and focus on that, even though the rest of the organization is in kind of whatever, doing whatever. But there's also something else in, I would say, in, in in the way our world is right now. And that is, especially as knowledge workers, attention is our most precious resource. Yeah. It's the idea of the attention economy that we are having right now. So, and when you think of companies like Facebook, Google, whatever, who become, became so skilled in directing our attention into whatever, towards you know, something we might want or need, but also often sometimes toward things we don't want or need. Um, I think of like high concentration basically as a self-defense skill today. So it's really something protecting your most precious resource. So that's concentration. So the second thing is clarity. That's the second skill of mindfulness. So what's, again, what's clarity? Clarity is the idea to experience the present moment with, in technical terms, more resolution and lower latency. Yeah. Yeah. Very technical. So what does it mean as an example? Well, you, you can imagine this as um, maybe... Uh, yeah, most of you are wearing glasses, so you know this effect. So I got my first pair of glasses when I was 20. And, you know, now I'm wearing contacts, so... But, you know, when I was 20, I, I got a pair of glasses and it was my first pair. And I still remember this moment when the, like, the person handed them to me and I put them onto my face. And I looked out of the window and I still remember there was a big tree out of the window, you know, through the, through the store. And I was like, wow. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, of course I saw the tree before and of course saw it's green, but now I can actually count the leaves, yeah? Wow, I haven't seen that for a long time. So it's the idea to actually have much more clarity on, on yeah, this, your, sense, your senses, basically. And the really interesting thing is that it's not just about having more clarity outside, like in this example with the glasses, but the really interesting thing is to have more clarity about what's going on inside. So the idea is that clarity gives you insight into what is going on why am I acting like that? Oh, I was just thinking that and that, and now I'm feeling angry. Or I was just thinking that, and now I'm feeling excited. Or I'm feeling excited, 
oh no, it's not excited, it's actually hungry. Um, so to have these kinds of clarity about what go what's going on. And that, of course, gives you um, a way to deal with things much smarter. It's just having more information available for making good decisions. So that's basically the effect. So what's the analogy? I mean, if we have a debugger, it's quite obvious. The analogy is I have the skills to actually know in what, what state I am. I can read variables, I can read states of objects, and so on and so on. And the benefit, like I said, I can act smarter on inputs I have. And there's also something about being able to appreciate life more. Yeah? If you have, like, you know, being able to appreciate whatever you experience right now with much more detail, it just usually becomes much more enjoyable. So there's also this aspect of happiness coming in, uh, satisfaction. So that's two of three. Third one is equanimity. In German, it's Gelassenheit. So that's the third skill of mindfulness. So what's equanimity? That's kind of the probably most difficult one or less uh, obvious to understand. So, and one of my teachers, he, he's a math geek and a meditation teacher, so he likes to explain it in terms of formulas. So, when he talks about equanimity, he always talks about these, t these two formulas. One is he talks about suffering and about discomfort. And what he says, and this is like a thousand-year-old Buddhist knowledge, like, in life, there will be discomfort. Yeah, it's no way around that. Yeah, I will hurt my toe, I will step onto something at some point in life. You know, life is impermanent, so things will change. I might, whatever, change a job, lose a job, lose a friend, lose a relationship. You know, you know it comes with a package. You can't live without experiencing at some point discomfort. But the trick is that we often add something to the discomfort. We often add what is called, here in this model, resistance to it. So the, I, the basic idea behind this model is, yes, discomfort is unavoidable, but what we do with an untrained mind is often you know, adding resistance to it, and resistance is in the form of, for example, a lot of, often it's in the form of judgments. You know, how can I be so stupid to bump my toe at this thing here? What an idiot, yeah? And so on and so on. So, and what that does is that it actually multiplies with, with the discomfort, and that makes the whole suffering, the whole package of suffering. And there's also a kind of promise in this, in this formula, like, because if you really develop your equanimity, you don't have basically resistance. So there, and if resistance is zero in this formula, there's also zero suffering. Yeah. Um, so only discomfort remains, which is unavoidable and part of life. Um, so equanimity is a lot about happiness in life, about, about relaxedness. Um, not in the sense that I don't care anymore, but in a sense of, um, yeah, being able to be with things and kind of float along with them. And I find this the hardest one to explain. So what's the analogy in technical terms? Well, the analogy is like if you use your environment to kind of refactor your code. You, you kind of refactor your, you know, the software of your operating system in a way that it runs with less resources, you know, less CPU cycles, less I.O., whatever, smoother UI, whatever you can think of. So it's kind of it just flows more. Yeah. And the benefit, well, one is, like I said, that it's a relationship to happiness. So one thing that meditation does, and for many meditation teachers, actually the ultimate goal is to increase happiness for yourself and for the people you're with. But when I think of the work environment, and especially when I think of my work as an agile coach, um, I also often think that equanimity is so useful when you have to deal with uncertainty and change. Because in an agile way, 
or in an agile world, we deal with differently with uncertainty than we do in a classical way. In a classical way, we try to, you know, push uncertainty away to, you know, you know, make it go away by good planning. Yeah, and of course, like if if you have a complex problem, it won't work. But you kind of create the illusion that. Because you have a good plan, everything is okay. There's not, there's only planned uncertainty. Yeah. Um, but in an agile way, we kind of live with uncertainty and we run experiments to explore it. But that means that on a personal level, uncertainty is, is can and often is uncomfortable. Yeah? Because we actually very often say, I don't know. Let's find out. We need to wait until we know how this experiment runs, and then we know what to do. And that's uncomfortable. Yeah. So very often, um, or in those situations, equanimity is really helpful to deal with that. Okay, so that's uh, the three skills of mindfulness that we want to develop. Questions so far? Okay, good. Then, Let's do a little practice. Let's see. So, like I said, I always like to do a little practice. Um, it's, I want to invite you to practice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to guide you a little bit through a meditation. Yeah? Uh, and I want to really say the most important thing is that this is an invitation. So if you're not happy to go along or like to listen to what I say, that's perfectly fine. Yeah? Please don't do it if you're not feel comfortable doing it. Um, very important. Um, the only thing I ask is that while we're doing the meditation is that you maybe not start to talk with other people. So just be quiet and whatever you want to do, do. Yeah? And for everyone who wants to join in, um, please join in. Um, so we will do this. Yeah, I'm going to do this obviously standing. I was just thinking if I can grab a chair, but I see they are connected. But I'm going to do this standing, which is perfectly fine. You can do meditation like standing, sitting, lying, and walking. So basically in any position you want. And in order to start, I would like you to find a position where you can sit in a way that is both relaxed and uh, alert at the same time. Yeah? So find a position like that. Usually, for most people, that means having both feet on the floor. If you want, you can experiment with putting your moving on your chair a bit forward and not leaning back. But you can also lean back. Just try to find a, a, comfor a comfortable position where you can be relaxed and alert at the same time. And I invite you to also close your eyes. If you are uncomfortable with that, that's also fine. And just Find a spot where you can um, rest your eyes like two, three meters in front of you and just have your eyes rest there. And take a moment to actually move your attention from the outside to the inside into your body. And just notice your body, how it is held by the chair and by the ground. Just notice the positions where uh, you have contact with the ground or the chair. So it might be in your feet, in your upper legs, maybe your back. And for this moment, just notice what sensory experiences you have. It might be that you, even if you have your eyes closed, that you have like inner visual experiences, like flickering lights or something. 
We have the sound from the beamer and the air conditioning. We have the physical sensations, the touch from the ground and the chair and where your body parts touch each other. And you might have other body sensations, like warm or cold. Maybe something is itching. And you will have sensations from the working of your body. So you might have a sense of your stomach digesting lunch. You might be able or not to feel your pulse somewhere in the body. And you have sensations of your breath. And now, just for the fun of it, we will narrow down our object of meditation. And so I like you to I'd like you to find a spot in your body where you can feel your breathing most clearly. So it might be in your chest or your abdomen, well, for many people it's actually at the tip of your nose where you can notice the air streaming in and out. So just choose a clearly defined spot in your body where you feel your breath clearly. And then focus your attention there. Let it rest there. Noticing every in-breath and every out-breath. And you might notice at some point that your attention is actually not with your breath anymore. It's somewhere else. 
maybe you were think thinking about lunch or what there is for dinner or how you liked this talk this morning that you heard. Or you might be not with your breath, but with the sounds in the room. Or with other body sensations than your breath. And that's a great moment to notice that, because that's the moment of practice. That's the moment when you are mindful, and then you simply come back. You reset your attention to be with your breath at that one spot. And you simply come back with your attention to that spot and start again to be with the next breath. And notice if you can stay curious with your breath. Imagine you've just been teleported into this body and the next breath is the first one you ever experience in this body. And then just take one breath to notice um, how you feel right now. And if there's any benef anything beneficial, anything you notice, just take that with you. It doesn't need to end just because we end this practice now. And then come back with your attention into the room. Open your eyes if you have them closed. Thank you. <coughs> Wow. I would like to hear one comment like from one person. How, how was that? I know it's always hard to speak up in a room with so many people. <laughs> Just one comment. Relaxing. Relaxing. Yeah. I actually haven't seen who said that. Was it you? Ah, you said okay. Okay, yeah, relaxing. Okay, great. Perfect. <laughs> Good. Um, so, let's look into science uh, a bit. So, what is science saying about meditation? Um, actually, I said, like, one thing that really changed in the last, like, 25 years is that science got into meditation. And that has a lot to do that with the fact that science has some new research tools for, like, 30, 35 years because that's kind of the time that we have like MRI machines, like magnetic resonance imaging and functional magnetic resonance imaging. So basically ways to examine the brain while it is still working. Because before that, if you wanted to look at the human brain, basically you have done that only when the person was dead. So, but now, or like for these like 30 years, researchers can actually explore how a brain ch changes and works in a living being and also explore that over time. And one of the main insights from that kind of machines was, um, from having yeah, these kinds of research capacities, was that the brain actually changes over time. And that's called neuroplasticity. So the brain actually adapts to how it is used. Before that, it was believed for a long time that an adult brain is basically static. Yeah, it's not really changing anymore. And then only when you get really old, you kind of things degenerate. But there's a long st that was the belief, a long stable period. And we have seen that that's wrong. And meditation also does that. Meditation also changes the brains, the brain. I would say that 
And we'll talk about that a bit later, a bit more. But to just give you an idea of how, of what happened in the last 25 years regarding science and mindfulness, um, I, I did a little research myself. Uh, I went to PubMed. PubMed is a big um, research database, uh, publicly available. And I just looked at how many papers were they with the word mindfulness in the title. Uh, 20 years ago, in a four-year period, it was 34. In the last four-year period, it was 3,000. So we have a huge, huge increase in research on mindfulness. So we will learn a lot in the next years about what is actually really working in detail and what is not. But we already know quite a bit stuff already. And um, I'm going to tell you a few things now. Um, what kind of effects meditation can have. So meditation very clearly affects intelligence and memory. Uh, one example is, um, so imagine you want to get into one of those prestigious American colleges or you have kids that you hope you want to get into them, uh, that, that you hope that they get into those. Um, eight hours of mindfulness training increases on average on admission tests by 13%. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, next thing is, it also has effects on the body. Yeah? And they did a very nice uh, um, study around that, um, where they actually used a control group. So they had like, I think, 25 people having a weekend of mindfulness training, on meditation training, and another 25 people were having a weekend of relaxation training, so with some relaxation training uh, exercises. So at the end of the weekend, both groups said, well, we are feeling a lot less stressed. So that was pretty similar. Three months later, um, the group who did mindfulness training, although they hadn't meditated in the three months, were still reporting being a lot less stressed. And they also did, um, they did blood samples and measured some inflammation markers. And the mindfulness groups had less of those inflammation markers in their blood. So it also affects the body. Um, it can affect social skills. Um, that is after like eight weeks of mindfulness training, a certain program. People self-report less stress in social situations, like speaking in public, for example, or like being in a room with uh, you know, your boss and 10 other bosses from other big companies and whatever. And they also measured more compassionate behaviors. So how do you measure compassionate behaviors? It's those fun measurements where they call you into a lab and you get some kind of task. And then on the way out, you, know, you happen to walk by someone who accidentally drops their books. Yeah. So, and then they measure how many people stop and in which way they help. And that's how they measure compassion and behavior. And there's a 50% increase in stuff like that after eight weeks of mindfulness training. And like I said, it also influences the brain. Yeah. Um, so what, what you can see with people with long-term meditators is that they radically experience stress differently. And I'm going to explain you how they experience that, and then I'm going to explain what the brain changes are. So, a regular person experiences stress usually something like this. You have a stress curve and it goes up, and then you have like a, a slow decrease. Yeah? And with meditators, it's a bit, long-term meditators, it's a bit different. Um, they have a curve like this, it goes up, and then if, if the, the trigger that causes the stress goes away, yeah, it falls down really quickly. And that's actually a very healthy thing to have. Because what's really not healthy is if we have stress, it goes up, we go down a bit, and then the next stressful thing comes so that we never go again to our kind of usual zero or normal stress level. Also, fun, the fun way how they test this is they, you know, they have someone in, in a lab, they you know, put all kinds of machinery on that person that measures stress. And what they do then is they fire a starter pistol behind their back. Uh, so it's kind of the, the pistols where they you know, start a race with. So. 
and this is how they, you know, things how they found out with meditators how they have this stress curve. So what's happening in the brain during that time? Um, in our brain, we have a structure that's called the amygdala. Um, amygdala is a very old structure in the brain, and it's, it's kind of in the middle, it's maybe like a smaller than a hazelnut, and it's, it's kind of pretty much in the middle, you have two of them on each side. Um, and the amygdala is responsible for kind of scanning, interpreting the information and scanning for threats. So, like, it, it's a really useful structure if you are, you know, like 10,000 years ago, you wander through the forests and, you know, every crack might be a saber-toothed tiger or whatever. You know, very useful structure. And, um, like, one of my friends always says is, we are the descendants of the nervous apes. So our amygdala is very well trained because the ones you know that didn't have a such well trained amygdala they just died you know they got eaten by something. The tragic thing is that our life changed so quickly in the last maybe couple hundred years um, that the amygdala is actually triggered by many other things. You know it might be triggered by you know your boss coming into your room with a you know red head, red face, you know being more. And that might trigger a reaction like that. Yeah? So, and it's actually true, for parts of your brain, a situation like that is the same as being you know, approached by a saber-toothed tiger, for parts of your brain. But it's really the same activation patterns, everything. So it's, it's the same level of stress. So this is about survival then. And of course, if the amygdala is triggered really strongly, it actually has the capacity to uh, down-regulate other parts of the brain, like the prefrontal cortex, that's kind of the new part, it's like, like it says uh, in the front here, and it can down-regulate this. And in the prefrontal cortex, you have things like you know, planning, language processing, stuff like that. So if someone, for example, in front of the group can't really talk anymore, or you know, gets a blackout, and they can't talk, it's literally because they can't talk anymore, because that part of the brain is kind of shut down. Yeah? And that's the power the amygdala has it get, if it gets triggered really strongly. And what we can see in, uh, in long-term meditators is that the activation pattern of the amygdala is like much lower, and if you meditate really, really long, and now I'm talking about maybe five or 10,000 10, hours, it actually structurally changes the brain. So they have a smaller amygdala and some other structures get larger. Yeah? But that's only after a couple of thousand hours. But still, effects on behavior are there even before. So how does an amygdala hijack, it's that, that's what it's called, if the amygdala takes over the other parts of the brain, how does that look like? I'm going to have a little example here. So what you see is a cat and two cucumbers that someone has put behind the cat without the knowing. That's probably for the cat in amygdala hijack. Yeah. So these things you can do with meditation. Um, I want to end um, with saying why am I medi doing this meditation thing? Because when I prepared for this talk, I realized, I mean, I'm, I'm not doing it to be 13% better on some college admission thing, so it's not really, why am I doing this actually? Why am I also like practicing like really, really regularly, usually daily, very seldom miss it, and like five minutes to 45 minutes a day or something? Why am I doing this? And one thing I realized when I prepared for this talk is that it's really this kind of hacker idea. Like this idea that I can actually really, really understand my brain, how it works, and, and you know, hack into that in, in like the best sense of the wor word hacking. Yeah? So there's a lot of just curiosity around that. And of course, like I would say with hacking, there's also always this element of power. Because like, if I really understand how my brain works, I can be just more the person I would like to be. And I can you know, do things I love better and so on. And the other thing is kindness and happiness. Um, 
I already said before that the main idea for many meditation teachers is to develop happiness in the person um, who's meditating. Um, and this is actually one promise I find really exciting. And the thing is actually you can even measure that. They also measured that with long-term meditation teachers. There's a way to measure happiness, and it has to do with kind of the difference of left uh, prefrontal cortex brainwaves and right prefrontal cortex brainwaves. So the bigger the difference, the, it's usually correlated with self-reported happiness. So when they started to have these long-term meditators in their labs, they also did that. They, they measured happiness. And they had one guy, and he's, he actually became quite famous, Ricard Mathieu. Ricard Mathieu is a French uh, biologist. He did a PhD at, uh, in a French university, and then he kind of stopped his uh, university uh, career and moved to Tibet to meditate for 30 years. So he has probably around 20,000 years of meditation, uh, 20,000 hours of meditation experience, not years. As he's not... He looks, he seems like he gets older, so no, it's not. Um, so 20,000 years. And he was the, one of the first people who was examined because he knew both worlds. He obviously knew the meditation world very well, but also kind of the Western scientific world. So they invited him. And, you know, they you know, applied all these, uh, the machinery that they need to measure happiness. And they were like baffled because he was way off the charts, like by a factor of, you know, 5,000% or something. So it's really like a factor of, no, no, five degrees of, uh, I don't know how to say that in English. Whatever, a, a long, a, a big one. Um, and, and then they realized, no, they are really measuring the real thing here. And... Um, and that was the moment he was coined the happiness, happiest man in the world, which he's not very happy about, but that's another story. <laughs> um, and, and the researcher, Richard Davidson, he's, the, he's a new scientist who did that kind of research. He describes this level of happiness in the following way. So he says, imagine you are outside and you have an elephant running straight towards you, a full-blown elephant. You know, running straight towards you. Imagine the intensity of emotion you're having. And then imagine you have that intensity of emotion in happiness. So happiness in this intensity that you have then. And then imagine that you can enter this state in a couple of seconds. This is what someone like um, Matthew Ricard can do. So. I have a little child, he's like, it's not that guy, uh, but he's seven months old, and I just want to be kind of happy around him because I'm much more playful and nicer to be with if I, if I have this kind of happiness. So that's why I'm doing that. Thank you very much.